Okay, so I so I made this up again, in other words, this document that you have <laughs> in like 15 minutes. <laughs> I tried to recreate it. Um, and what I thought we would do today is just start moving through some of the arguments in the text that you have, starting with the introduction and, and just kind of see uh, what's going on there and why he says some of the things that he does, because I'm sure as you were reading this, this was your main question was, well, what's his motivation for going through all of these intricate arguments, right? Um, so hopefully we can have a conversation about that today. And um, The first thing I wanted to point out uh, is that Hobbes, uh, there's, there's two, really two sources of knowledge for the person who wants to learn from Hobbes. Okay? One is, of course, observation of the physical world, right? Not, um, all around us, including human behavior, okay? And um, in another book, De Chive, he actually says, um, you know, watch what other people do and how you react to them, okay? In today's language, you know, do you, uh, when you leave your car in Aggieville, do you lock the doors? <laughs> do you? <laughs> if you do, why? <laughs> You should. <laughs> yeah. have, have any of you ever gotten stuff stolen out of your car? Not it's, here, no. It's the number one most frequent crime in Manhattan, Kansas, is uh, stealing items from unlocked cars. So if you do keep your, your, you know, you're playing the odds and the odds are not with you, okay? Back in Hobbes' day, of course, it was uh, banditry was, was a common occurrence both burglary as well as um, roadside banditry, right? So people would be going along in their horse-drawn carriage and or riding their horse and out of the woods would pop these vagabonds who would steal everything they had. Um, but, but Hobbes even says, in, in your own home, okay, and back then, and he worked for a very wealthy family, right? So people with money hired servants. And he said, do you lock up your valuables at night? Even though you work with these people every day, you see them every day, do you lock up your safe? Well, yes, you know. So what does this say about human nature? So that's, that's one thing, our observation. But then he also says here in Leviathan, look within yourself, okay? and really be honest about yourself and your own motivations. And that's um, kind of a, a daring statement on his part, right? Because you don't want to insult your audience. And they, everybody wants to think better of themselves than that, but he says um, on the bottom of 118 on the left, let one man read another by his actions Never so perfectly, it serves him only with his, with his acquaintance, acquaintances, which are but few. He that is to govern a whole nation must read in himself, not this or that particular man, but mankind. Meaning, whatever your inner motivations really are, you can rest assured those are fairly similar to the rest of mankind. Which, though it be hard to do, harder than to learn any language or science, Yet when I shall have set down my own reading orderly and per purpose, I can't even pronounce that, perspicuously, the pains left another will only be to consider if he finds not the same in himself. Okay, so why is it that looking within yourself and really being objective about yourself <clears throat> and your motivations is harder to learn than any language or science? That's pretty hard. I mean, I haven't decided to learn another language. <laughs> I've yeah. decided to stop learning languages. <laughs> I had to learn two for my PhD, and I found that very hard, you know. So he's saying it's harder to know yourself. Why? Because the other one, you're just receiving, you're downloading information, essentially. Mm -hmm. you can, I mean, there's an extent to which you're no longer the active participant of your education. I read a book that teaches me Russian, therefore I know Russian, but there's no like manual on yourself. <laughs> no. So you have to do all the work, I guess. Mm -hmm. You have to do all the work, 
Um, so in that sense, it's, it's murkier too. It isn't all laid out for you, steps one through three, right? Anything else that makes it uh, particularly hard to know yourself well? Remember Sun Tzu said that the two keys to winning a war are knowing yourself and knowing your enemy, right? So 50% is knowing yourself as a commander in that case. What can other things just get in the way other than the, the sheer effort? The things that you want to believe about yourself could probably interfere with that. Like, you know, if you're just, you know, going along with life and you've never really thought about that kind of thing and you think you're a nice person, but then you go and you actually think mm -hmm. about it, it's like, no, I don't really want to believe that. I don't mm -hmm. want to believe that about myself when it could be true. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You want to believe the best about yourself. And people have a way, if they deviate from what they consider to be the, the correct path, moral path or you know, ethical path, they, they find ways to reconcile that in their minds, right? I'm still a good person because the reason I did this was because of these X, Y, and Z, these reasons, right? And so when we, when we do have to confront our faults, we tend to reconcile them in that way and, and sort of reason them away so that it doesn't interfere with our general perception of ourselves as good people. Uh, or in the case of the commander, oftentimes it's the perception of himself as truly effective and smart and knowing what to do all the time, right? <laughs> Arrogance, you know, ho that's what Hobbes would call this, is that, that people, not only do they want to see themselves as good, but they want to see themselves as smart and effective. And when information intervenes that um, to the contrary, uh, they will talk themselves out of it, right? Uh, in his own day, okay, lots of people during the English Civil War, and this is all from his perspective, okay, but they, but they listened to preachers who told them, you know, God wants us to worship this way, and, you know, you need to rally around the, the flag, so to speak, and we'll fight, and we'll, we'll win this battle, and England will become what we envision. Um, and uh, people made the decision to follow and to fight and to kill and be killed. That was, in his view, a grave mistake. They traded relative security for chaos, right? But in their minds, they said, well, despite the fact that my family died and I no longer have a job, I did the right thing. I, you know, uh, God will reward me. I will, you know, in the long run, will benefit and everybody else will from my actions. So there's always a way that people come around to denying that they made a mistake. They rewrite their own history. So this is a, that's why he and, he and other realists tend to make a huge point over this. Machiavelli did too. He said that the number one problem for princes is themselves. They can't see themselves clearly and they're not objective about it. So if you if you can't, then you can't correct your mistakes. You can't, you know, actually change. All right, so this is difficult, but it's possible and a lot of his book is designed to sort of beat down people's preconceived notions about themselves and others and really see human nature in a clear light, right? We are self-interested creatures. We tend to do what we think will make us more powerful, wealthier, more admired, right? Or save us from danger. I mean, these basic motivations are there. Um, we, we tend to not think first about other people or sacrificing our interests for them. Not really, okay? So it's a very cynical view of human nature that he's gonna expose, especially when he gets to the account of the state of nature, which is, uh, we, we probably will get to a little bit of that on Friday, okay? But first, he goes through several chapters of just discussing the physical uh, account or the physical dimension of human thought, you know, um, and we have to talk about why he even bothers to do this. There, he wrote a whole book, before he wrote Leviathan, he wrote a book called Of Man, or De Homini, 
uh, in which he made these arguments he, you know, without going on into his political thought and in even more detail. Okay, but here he kind of gives us the um, uh, what he thinks we need in order to build on his uh, later philosophy. So he starts out with this chapter of sense. I remember last time I mentioned that people thought that objects sent you know, species or you know, actual physical things somehow. So, um, so there's this old-fashioned Aristotelian notion that physical objects actually send subtle particles of some kind towards your senses and they impact your eyes, your nose, your ears, etc. And then those uh, have their effect upon your body and then your brain perceives them. Now what Hobbes says happens, which he thinks is different, this is a different account, he says on uh, page 118 over on the right of chapter 1, he says, the cause of sense is the external body or object which presseth the organ proper to each sense, either immediately, as in the taste or touch, or immediately, as in seeing, hearing, and smelling, which pressure by mediation of nerves okay, and other strings and membranes of the body continued inwards to the brain and heart causeth there a resistance or counter pressure or endeavor of the heart, effort of the heart to deliver itself from which effort or endeavor causes because outward seemeth to be some matter without. I know that's very difficult going, so let me see if I can break it down. And I also want to ask you how different this is from the previous account that he makes fun of. But um, one thing that he wants to make clear is, and this is, this is the important thing, okay, is that when our body makes that endeavor or effort to resist or react to the pressure from what we see, hear, taste, and so forth, it becomes our experience, right? It is mediated, in other words, by our bodies. When we see something, our unique eyes, which are physical objects, no two are alike, no two sets, I should say, <laughs> then we see things a little differently, okay? We smell, you know, some people have different taste and smell, right? My son, he can't really hardly taste certain ranges. I think he's got allergy problems. So when he tastes something, I'll say, oh, don't you taste that bitter taste? And he'll say, no. He can eat just about anything, but I'm not sure he enjoys it as much. I hope he gets over it. My mom is colorblind, which doesn't mean she sees in black and white, but there are ranges of color that she can't perceive or she perceives differently, like browns and greens and reds. They, they tend to kind of get mixed up in her mind. But even if you don't have an impairment, Hobbes is saying, every body is different, right? So really what you, and this is the, you gotta wrap your mind around this, what you experience is not um, exactly what's in the outside world. What you experience is what your body perceives it to be. So you have no, connection with the absolute reality outside of you. It doesn't mean that you're floating around in a void, but I mean, yeah, go ahead. Isn't that what, kind of what Plato said? Mm. Like, either you see objects, not the real? Well, not, no, not quite. Um, in fact, in a way, it's, you know, he's arguing against this notion because at least Plato said there are certain things that we can absolutely know based on these ideas that are already implanted in our head. There are certain ideas like the idea of an absolutely perfect circle or a tree or justice and these things are true eternal and our mind can understand them 100 percent of the time now i think what you're thinking is he also said in the world because things change uh nothing in the world is absolutely true it's because they're constantly changing and and they're not perfect um but 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 the difference is Plato is saying we can know and we can share this knowledge 
your circle is my circle, right? Your tree is my tree. And we can actually use argument to arrive at the same definition of justice, and we will both know it the same way. Whereas Hobbes is, is really going to argue because of this physical mediation, your circle isn't my circle. Your justice is never going to be my justice. We can't have that absolute agreement through philosophy. Mathematics would be the one exception. He doesn't deal with it a great bit because it is an exception to his rule, two plus two equals four everywhere and at all times, despite what we talked about in DAS 300. <laughs> so, but, uh, but, but everything else, and, and the reason why this is important is because we can't agree, according to Hobbes, on, through philosophical reasoning. We can't come to an agreement, right? And this is why we need to have somebody more or less tell us what artificially we ought to agree about, you know, there has to be order about what justice is, you know, and somebody has to lay the law down, and then we all hopefully can see the reason why that is good, right, but this is, this is why he uh, makes such a big deal out of this, yeah. Um, if we could, like Plato says, actually use philosophy to arrive at what is right, conceivably we wouldn't need authoritarian government to force us to be just. We could see why government ought to be good and have good laws and we ought to be you know, able to govern ourselves and be good people without being forced to be. Does that make sense? Okay, so there's where one of the differences lies. Now, having said that, you know, given you the reason why he makes this argument, let's just take a look at, at how he characterizes the so-called philosophy schools. These are the so-called schoolmen or divines that worked at the universities. Oh, this, is, this is kind of when he was kind of making a jab at him a little bit. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, he's making a jab at him. He yeah. constantly makes jabs at yeah, them. Yeah, he does. He thinks that they're full of crap, basically, that, that the universities are full of people who pontificate with a lot of hot air but don't really know what they're talking about. No wonder he didn't have very many friends in academia. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense now. <laughs> yeah, so he, he goes on and on about that. Um, all, on uh, page 119 on the left, first full paragraph, he says, but the philosophy schools through all the universities of Christendom grounded upon certain texts of Aristotle, teach another doctrine, and say, for the cause of vision that the thing seen sendeth forth on every side a visible species, a visible show, apparition, or aspect, or a being seen. Those are all terms that they used, right? They, they came up with a lot of terminology that sounded, in his view, sounded scientific, but was not scientific. You know, the, the word substituted for a scientific method. Um, the receiving whereof into the eye is seeing, and for the cause of hearing that the thing heard sendeth forth an audible species, that is an audible aspect or audible being seen, which entering at the ear maketh hearing. Nay, for the cause of understanding also they say the thing understood sendeth forth intelligible species. That literally, if you if you understand something, it's because your brain receives intelligible in, or information, right? Um, that is an intelligible being seen, etc. So, what difference do you see between his physical account and their physical account? Is there a difference? He's got. Um in his account, like the body is doing the interpreting, whereas with their account, there is no individual interpretation between different people. It's all the same stuff that's being sent out. Right, mm -hmm. right, and it makes a huge difference. Both of them are actually pseudo-scientific explanations, but the purpose of Hobbes's is to point out the perspective matters, right? Whereas in theirs, the idea is nature tells us the truth and we all can perceive it the same way and if we can then we can reach agreement easier he wants to emphasize how hard it is for people to reach agreement so that's it you know i mean um otherwise 
he, he presents his explanation as far more scientific than theirs, but if you really look at it, you know, both of them are just verbal explanations. They don't, he has no physical proof. He, he hasn't dissected a human body and, you know, found where the impact point is or observed the eye resisting or anything like that, right? Um, that's what science would, would require. All right, so, <coughs> and yes, he, he, <coughs> he makes them sound ridiculous, and he, and he keeps going. Well, is the last, I underline the last one, it seems like he said that, is the last part when he says a monster which the frequency of insignificant speech is one, is that him making fun? Amongst then, which the frequency of yes, okay, that's of insignificant. <laughs> that's just yeah. an outright nasty jab, yeah. you know. And because of all this, we see, especially in the universities, this use of nonsense. Basically, he uses a lot of different terms for this, but insignificant. It's speech. almost like he just goes off on like small tangents throughout, just mm -hmm. ranting about how much he despises them. It's mm -hmm. kind of funny. And he's, he's kind of irritated, you know, he's, he's not a nice guy. He, he lived into his 80s, he lived a long time, he loved playing tennis, he never got married, he never had kids. Um, surprising. Probably the recipe for health and happiness, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, but, you know, but, but people, I mean, they recognized that he was bright, but was he super well liked? No, because he had this tendency to just, you know, he, he wouldn't let go, and, it, and he was very clever. I mean, when you read this, I hope this caused you to kind of laugh a little from time to time. Oh, there he goes again, no, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he calls them schoolmen, divines, you know, teachers of absurdity. Yeah, he switches it around a lot. Mm-hmm, right. And it, tiny insults that are sometimes harder to follow about. Uh-huh, yeah. There's yeah. one, I can't remember where it's at that I laughed at. It was made me laugh last night. I, was, I can't have, I'll find out. Well, yeah, when we get there, it. you'll probably see it pointed out. But uh, yeah, it's, it's fun to, uh, once you kind of understand what he's up to, to try to find all of these small little insults uh, that he builds in, he's disdainful of their entire project. Um, Okay, so he moves on to of imagination, and this is where he gets into um, how it is that the human mind can come up with things that we haven't seen in this world. You know, there's all sorts of things like that. Uh, monsters, and I mean, what else can you think of that we, we read about in our fiction, and uh, movies and theater. What kind of things do you know about that no one's ever seen? Gods and gods. Okay, there's that, yes. And, and you know, I mean, you kind of jump to the conclusion in a way, but this is what you have to keep in mind is he'll go all around this, but, but he won't quite ever say it. But if you apply his reasoning, that's where it ends up, right? Um, he'll never say that. In fact, he, he makes an effort at the end of, of, near the end of his book to say, no, 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 God exists, but based on what I've said, it, he has to be physical somewhere, somewhere, you know, not here, but somewhere else um, in the world, okay? But yes, it, it, this type of um, reasoning calls into question visions, uh, prophecy, um, you know, all of those teachings of things that we haven't been able to see, right? Um, he wants us to think of the chimera, the, the monster, the, the uh, vision of, uh, that comes in a nightmare. You wake up and you think it might be real, but it's not, you know? Uh, and just start thinking about that. That's how he gets his foot in the door. Um, but he says of imagination, where do those images come from that we sometimes mistake for real? How do, how do they get into our heads to begin with? The monster, the dragon, the Bigfoot, <laughs> whatever, aliens, not, none of which we've seen. 
if, if, if what we think of is a, a product of our body reacting to external stimuli, but those stimuli don't exist, how do they get into our heads? I don't know where he argues it, but it, yeah. somewhere is that um, it's because of memory. It's like different things that you have experienced in life, and it's kind of a mixture of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost like he's saying that the brain is a big computer, which is kind of insightful, and it stores memories. It stores what we've seen, and then especially when we're asleep or we're sick or we, you know, feeling off, you know, uh, we're not in a full state of consciousness. Those ideas and, and what's stored in our head will get mixed up, right? And so the monster is, is a product of lots of actual beings that we've seen put together in an unusual way, okay? The alien, you know, the little green man with big eyes and a small head is, is a combination of human, be human figures and creatures and and you know maybe maybe our mind has an, a fish in you know it also has a child and you know all in, but somehow it ends up with coming up with this view this image of, of the alien but that doesn't mean it actually exists in the real world this re-emphasizes how much our personal perceptions matter it's what we internally do with what we've seen that creates our world. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, what does he mean by decaying sense? That um, once, you know, the, in his view, um, the full impact of your experience happens right away when your mm -hmm. body resists, so to speak, when it actually butts up against you, get the most clear perception that you're going to get. And then over time, the, the memory, and he doesn't explain how this is stored in your mind, but as you, over time, that memory gets a little bit less okay. distinct, right? And we do experience that. I mean, that's based on his observation that usually um, the longer the time is from your experience, the less uh, vividly you remember some, something. So the decay of the sense actually makes it even more likely that you will put these murky, murky ideas together. Yeah. Um, Yep, he says, imagination is therefore nothing but decaying sense and is found in men and many other living creatures sleeping as well as waking. The decay of sense in men waking is not the decay of the motion made in sense, but an obscuring of it in such manner as the light of the sun obscureth the light of the stars, which stars do no less exercise their virtue by which they are visible in the day than at the night. Okay, so um, it's that... I mean, if I had to try to interpret this, and this is kind of, I mean, the schoolmen could pick him apart here too, but um, it would be that as we experience new things, the old things get less important or covered up by new things. And so your current experience is in the foreground, they're in the background, and that's why they're, they're fading, okay? This is what I happen to think. It may not be exactly what he meant. <laughs> it's kind of hard, hard to do sometimes. Um, and then he goes on to say there's such a thing as the simple imagination and then compound imagination. And it's the compound imagination uh, that gives us the monsters and the visions, the, the, the strange stuff that, hmm, prophets wrote about, which he doesn't say right here, but, you know, um, yeah, so compound imagination is, is what creates the centaur, um, the mythological creature. Okay. Our brain puts it together in different ways. Okay. All right. So, we've already kind of answered this question, what way of thinking does the very rational and physical account of imagination challenge? It challenges the religious way of thinking, okay? Um, and you're right, he doesn't exactly, he doesn't dwell on it here. He does get into it, but you, I hope you notice whenever he does get into religion, like on the right-hand side of 121, you could perceive him to be talking about Catholicism. And this is a strategy that he uses. Um, 
if he takes on religion as being absurd, he will make it sound like he's criticizing Catholicism because that's acceptable. It's acceptable because, you know, by and large, the English people were very anti-Catholic. So, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it's crazy. Ghostly men, holy water, exorcism, uh, elsewhere he talks about transubstantiation, etc. Those are all Catholic in their, you know, you can relate to them as, as, as part of the Catholic faith. But when you further think about it, there are a lot of things that he mentions that could also be applied to Christianity more generally. Okay, so this is a rhetorical strategy that he uses. Um, okay. Yeah, on the left-hand side of that page, he, he uh, discusses a little bit further how it is that we can have these, we can have these dreams, and then we wake up and we think it's a vision. Okay, and what's the difference between a dream and a vision in most people's minds? A dream is just something fantastical. A vision is something that's going to come true mm -hmm. or has already happened. It's a, something that you think may, will come true because it comes from, you perceive the vision to come from some source outside of yourself. The dream, you could, have, you could think, well, that's from you know, what I ate today or <laughs> you know, the weird TV show that I watch. But, um, but if you have something that is extremely vivid and it seems to be predictive, you know, like for instance, maybe you see a car crash or somebody dying or and it's somebody you know right um, you might take that as a sort of omen a vision of, of what's going to happen in the future and you might think that probably came from some external source maybe God you know gave me this vision and if we take it one step further um, we have Christian visionaries right and uh, you know generally prophets uh, in all three of the religions of the book basically who had these visions right God speaking to Moses in the burning bush um, and from Hobbes point of view if we were to force him to be honest at this point what was that really Moses confronting God in the burning bush just a dream Probably that's the way he would see it, just a dream, you know. Yeah, right. But he's got to be very careful here. Now, the reason why I point this out is because this is so, it's so crucial to understand the attitude of early modern and modern liberal thought on religion, okay? It's very easy for people to uh, sort of try to explain this away or to not deal with it. Right, but Hobbes and Locke both found religion very, very problematic, uh, and and spent a great deal of time trying to figure it out and try to figure out what to do about it. Hobbes goes further than Locke, really, in his just continual probing into what these religious concepts mean, and even his eventual reinterpretation of a lot of the biblical um, ideas and stories and so forth. But, um, but I mean, suffice it to say, he's a pre-liberal thinker, but th these, these philosophers um, were really grappling with, with Christianity and the conflict that it produced um, and uh, were moving towards enlightenment thought, sort of the rationalization of it. And this is, this is key to understanding West, the Western liberal tradition. Okay. Um, so Hobbes kind of makes it difficult for us to avoid this. Um, all right, so next he has a chapter on the consequence or train of imaginations. Okay, so let's see, on page 122, down at the bottom left, he says, this train of thoughts or mental discourse is of two sorts. Okay, he's, he's previously talked about how, you know, once an idea is in your mind, it goes back and forth. It's almost like a physical process. 
your thinking is actually, you know, the, the, the idea going back and forth somehow in your mind. And, um, this train of thoughts or mental discourses of two sorts. The first is unguided, without design. What would we call that? What was that? Subconscious. Yeah, more. I mean, we might call it the subconscious. It's what's going on without us really controlling it. Like daydreams. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, your mind is constantly at work, right? I mean, it's always got something going on, but most of the time, you, you weirdly may not be totally even aware of it. Isn't that strange to think about? That you might not be, your mind is wandering, you know, pretty soon. You're thinking about the movie that you saw last night, or who knows what, and you're like, whoa, I was reading. Have you ever read through a couple of pages? <laughs> you have no idea what you read because you're thinking about something. 